All right, so in this chapter, uh, we are going to talk about uh, the history of astronomy. And uh, uh, this is a very fascinating subject, but we will just have time to barely scratch the surface. So astronomy, as I've mentioned earlier, is the oldest science. So our ancestors have been looking up at the stars and wondering what it all means um, ever since we have been humans. So it's the oldest science uh, of all. So ancient civilizations used astronomy in a number of different ways. So one thing that they used astronomy for was to determine the time of the day. And so you must have heard of sundials. Uh, there are sundials all over the world, very, very old ancient sundials all over the world. Uh, if you have ever seen the Egyptian, I, I mean, uh, seen a picture or actually seen the Egyptian obelisks, that's that's a, uh, an example of a device that was used to mark the time of the day using the shadow of the sun. Um, other things that astronomy was used for was to mark the seasons uh, and, and also the sun's position on uh, special dates. So probably the most famous example of, uh, of this is Stonehenge. And um, Stonehenge is very fascinating and you can read more about it on the internet if you if you want. But uh, here is a picture of Stonehenge. It's basically a, a, a collection of a large number of standing stones, uh, which are arranged in these rings. And uh, over the years, uh, scientists have found out that there is a, a lot of astronomical significance to the way the stones are arranged. So for example, uh, on, on one of these days, I've forgotten which one, maybe uh, win winter solstice or summer sto solstice, one of those two days, the sun rises exactly in between uh, these two uh, these two main stones, the, the, the two at the front that you can see over here. Uh, unfortunately, I can't write on this. But um, so these are called the heel stones and, and the sun rises exactly between these heel stones on, on the day of solstice. So there's also many other uh, significances as well. Um, so Stonehenge is one example. Uh, another example is the sun dagger. Uh, the sun dagger is, uh, is in New Mexico and uh, it's, uh, it's what it's, that's what it's called now. It's basically this uh, intricate arrangement of, uh, of, stone, uh, of stone structures such that the uh, on on a particular day and i think that's also the summer solstice uh the you have a sliver of sunlight which goes through uh like and look looks just like a dagger and this is amazing so i have to show you a video of this so here is a video of the sun dagger um all right so watch how so watch carefully what's going to happen now. You see this ringed concentric surface and watch what the sunlight is doing. You can see how uh, a dagger, it's almost perfectly shaped like a dagger. Uh, so this dagger shaped sliver of sunlight goes through uh, this, uh, this figure. It's pretty amazing. So it happens on one day of the year. Um, okay, oops, keep clicking this, okay. So these are examples of uh, astronomical, uh, of devices that were constructed by ancient civilizations to mark the position of the sun on special dates and there, thereby also mark the seasons. Um, and then uh, astronomy was used also to build lunar calendars based on the lunar cycle. Okay, uh, another example is this uh, uh, medicine wheel, which was found in Wyoming, I think, uh, used by uh, Na Native Americans. And uh, the arrangement of the stones here have astrological, uh, astronomical significance. Um, okay. Now, ancient Chinese also studied astronomy very carefully. So they kept detailed records of everything that they saw in the sky. But they paid particular attention to omens, which are basically things that would show up as different in the sky. So, so they'd keep an eye on the sky, and if they saw some, anything different, anything new that showed up on the sky, they would consider that an omen. And things that they would usually uh, that would show up as new or different would usually be comets. 
Uh, so comets suddenly, as we learn later on in this course, comets show up in the sky and they have a very peculiar structure and they, they move uh, through the sky. I mean, you don't see them actually moving, but if you track their position from night to night, you can see that the position is changing, which means that they're moving pretty quickly. And so, uh, and then they disappear. So the Chinese paid particular attention to these things that were new in the sky and they called them omens. And... Um, uh, and and so they also pay, and they also paid attention to eclipses and uh, and and sunspots. So sunspots we'll learn later on are basically these spots or splotches on the surface of the sun. So the Chinese paid attention to these things as well. So they also took meticulous records of everything that they saw in the sky. And so ancient astronomers, uh, uh, modern astronomers, uh, rely on these Chinese records for observational data. Um, that they recorded during the Dark Ages. So if you remember your history, the Dark Ages in Europe were from the 5th to the 10th century AD, and that was a particularly bad time for Europe because there was a lot of warfare going on. And so not a lot of uh, astronomy uh, was done during that time, or there's hardly any records of any astronomical observations during that time. So uh, for that period, uh, modern astronomers rely on the records of the Chinese. Okay, one interesting thing uh, in, in the Chinese records is that they were they noticed a guest star uh, in the year 1054. So uh, in the year 1054, uh, and here is the actual inscription for it. So uh, if any of you can read Chinese, I don't know if, if you can make sense of this even if you read Chinese because this is very ancient Chinese. So, um, so People who can read this uh, say that in the highlighted portion over here, they're saying that there was this star in the sky which was so incredibly bright. It was they, they, they say that it's bright, as bright as the full moon, and it lasted for uh, many months. And, uh, and so basically it's believed that what they saw was the supernova uh, that happened in uh, 1054 AD and it's named SN1054 is the name of the supernova and so that would have been a pretty bright object in the sky uh, and and so uh, the Chinese have seen it and they've taken detailed records of it and it's just amazing that uh, we we can see the evidence of this supernova uh, in in the in the Chinese records from 1054 incidentally this particular supernova was not just seen by the Chinese it was seen by people all over the world uh, there are ancient cave drawings from the same period uh, I mean Native American cave drawings from the same period uh, which which seem to indicate like a bright object in the sky uh, so that's they, they probably also saw it so uh, so yeah uh, that is ancient Chinese astronomy now Islamic astronomy is also very important historically. So during the, from the Dark Ages to the beginning of the Renaissance, um, uh, Islamic astronomy flourished and, uh, and pres uh, preserving and augmenting the knowledge of the Greeks. So uh, during the Renaissance period, the Greeks made a lot of progress in, in all fields of science, uh, also astronomy. Uh, but then the Dark Ages began. So, so at that time, the work that was done by the uh, by the Renaissance scholars uh, went uh, was preserved by the Islamic astronomers by by uh, Islamic astronomers uh, they they weren't really called astronomers at that time and uh, and and so they also made their own very important contributions in astronomy so many astronomical terms such as zenith azimuth uh, which we talked about in the last class we talked about both zenith and azimuth in the last class uh, and then the names of several stars like aldebaran Betelgeuse, uh, these all come from Islamic astronomy. Islamic astronomers also developed many mathematical techniques, so a lot of techniques in algebra and trigonometry uh, come from Islamic astronomers. Okay, now the ancient as astronomers or our ancestors uh, observed what are the things that they looked at in the sky. So they obviously saw the sun, they saw the moon, they saw the stars, and then they saw five spots of light, which we nowadays call Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Our ancestors didn't know what they were, but these five spots of light 
just drove them crazy. Do you know why they drove them crazy? The reason that these five spots of light drove them absolutely crazy is because it was not easy to understand how they move in the sky. So these spots of light were clearly different from the sun and the moon and the stars. Unlike the stars, they did not twinkle. And also, uh, they were their positions in the sky keep changing, right? And also, not only that, not only do they keep changing, they change in ways that are not easy to understand. So, for example, let's take Mars. So, suppose, I think I have an example here. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is what I just said. So, the, su the sun and the moon and the stars all have simple movements in the sky. But uh, the planets um, are st were strange to, uh, to our ancestors. Uh, they appeared very strange to our ancestors because, A, they seem to be moving with respect to the stars, right? B, they would change their brightness. So sometimes the same planet might appear very bright, other times it might appear much dimmer. Then the speed at which they seem to be moving through the sky, uh, and remember when I say moving through the sky, it does not mean like the, the way you see an aeroplane or a bird flying through the sky. Uh, you would just see its position change from night to night, right? So the, the speed at which it would change its position in the sky from night to night would also change. So sometimes it would be moving pretty fast, other times it would be moving slow. And also the direction in which they move through the sky would, would seem to change. So, so you might be following Mars in the sky for a, for a few uh, for a few days, and you might be you might see okay. So let's let's say that um, let's say you're, that you're looking at Mars like this over here in the sky one night. Next night you find that Mars is over here. All right. The night after that you find Mars is over here. So you think that okay, I, I'm I'm getting a hang of it. So Mars is moving in this direction. Uh, following night you find that it's over here. So you're like okay, I get I get it. It's it's, it's trying to move in this direction. However, a night uh, after a few days, you might find that instead of going forward, Mars has slowed down. So after after a while, you might see that it's only made a very small amount of progress, then an even small amount, a smaller amount of progress, and then you find that it's going backwards. So uh, it's it's over here, and then after that, it's over here, and and so on. So it might it's changed its mind and it's now going in the opposite direction. But again, after a while, you'd fi you'll find that again it's changed its mind and started going to the left again. So this kind of motion where a planet sometimes appears to be moving uh, in the backward direction to the direction in which uh, it normally moves is called retrograde motion. Um, retrograde motion. And so all the planets seem to exhibit retrograde motion, which means that most of the time they would be moving in one particular direction, but sometimes they would change their mind and be moving backwards. And then again they would, uh, then again they would turn around and move in the forward direction and so on. So this is called retrograde motion. Let me give you an actual example of retrograde motion. So let's say that you're looking at Mars and on the 1st of November you see Mars right here. Okay, I think I'll use my marker. So on the 1st of November, you see Mars right here. 1st of December, you see Mars right there. So in one month, it's changed its position in the sky quite a bit. 1st of January, it's only over here. So it's not made that much progress between December and Jan. I mean, over the month of December. All right, what about in February? On 1st of February, it's all the way over here. So it's going backwards now. 1st of March, it's way backwards, all the way over here. So it seems to have completely changed its mind and it's going backwards now. But 1st of April, you find that it's only moved, a, it's slowed down a lot. It, it's only moved up till here. And then 1st of May, you find that it's again changed its mind and now it wants to go back the way it was going. So it's over here. And June, it's really sped up and moved all the way over here. So it did this loop in the sky, right, um, over a period of few months. So this kind of motion where the planet seems to go in the opposite direction for a while is called retrograde motion. And all the planets exhibit retrograde motion, and that is something our ancestors did not understand at all. It was very difficult for them to grasp wha what the reason is for this. Okay. 
Now, all of you have probably heard of Aristotle and Pl Plato. So Plato lived between 427 to 347 BC and he wrote about moral responsibility, ethics, nature of reality, uh, civil government and so on. Okay, Plato's student Aristotle lived from 384 to 322 BC and he also wrote on a variety of topics. So Aristotle is considered the father of moder modern philosophy, very important philosopher. Uh, he was also a very smart person, but unfortunately, almost everything he figured out um, in science is wrong. And mainly, the reason for that is because he did not have available to him the tools of modern science, uh, the, the, the conceptual tools that we use. So we talked about the scientific method in our first lecture. So the correct way to understand science is to use the scientific method. Um, Aristotle did not know that. So the scientific method is not something that we always knew. It was gradually discovered, right? Uh, we'll see some of that in this chapter. So Aristotle did not know the correct way to understand nature. So in his time, it understanding nature was considered to be uh, a part of philosophy. In fact, physics was also called natural philosophy for a very long time. So what Aristotle and Plato believed was that in order to understand science, uh, you just start with uh, some inviolable principles, first principles, and then you reason onward from those. And, and that, that's how you figure things out. You start with something, some, uh, some basic assumptions, which you uh, assume that are absolutely true and cannot be wrong in any way. And then based on that, you, through reasoning, philosophical reasoning, you try to understand things. But that's not the correct way to do things in science, because what if your basic assumptions are wrong? What if your first principles are wrong, and then everything you figured out based on that is also wrong, right? So that is why most of the things that Aristotle and Plato figured out were, were wrong, because they did not have the correct framework for thinking about science. Okay, so they used reasoning from first principles, which to us seems uh, a fairly silly way of thinking about science, but they didn't know that at the time. All right, so in the Aristotelian universe, so the, the way Aristotle imagined the universe is the following. It's called the geocentric universe, and you'll see in a moment why it's called geocentric. So Aristotle imagined that the Earth is at the center of a geocentric universe. So the Earth is at the very center of everything, and everything that we see in the sky, like all the stars, planets, um, sun and the moon, everything is rotating around the Earth in uniform circular motion, which means everything is going ar uh, orbiting the Earth in a circle, uh, uh, following a circular path at a fixed speed. So in Aristotle's geocentric universe, He imagined that you have the Earth at the center and everything orbits the Earth. So the moon goes around the Earth, the sun goes around the Earth, and all the planets, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, all of them go around in perfect circles around the Earth. So this is called the geocentric universe. Geo means Earth, centric means the Earth is at the center. So this was Aristotle's geocentric universe. And there were some other things that they also believed. Um, the sun and the moon and the planets, Aristotle believed, were perfect spherical orbs. So notice that all the objects that are orbiting the Earth are going around in circles, right? So it's very important. So this, the idea of a circle was very, very important to Aristotle. Not only that, uh, as I just said, all the heavenly bodies like this, the, the moon and the sun and the planets, uh, they were all assumed to be perfect spheres, spherical orbs. Why is there such an emphasis on something being circular or something being spherical? It is because people, people at that time believed that 
the God created everything, right? So uh, God created everything and God created us. And so we are obviously the most important thing uh, in the world. So um, in, the, in the whole universe. So we are at the center of all creation. And everything is orbiting the earth in a circle. Why a circle? Because a circle was considered to be the most perfect shape. So why would God choose any other shape than a circle? Because the circle was considered to be the most perfect shape. And then also these heavenly bodies like the moon and the sun and the planets, they were all thought to be spheres. So if the circle is the most perfect two-dimensional shape, a sphere would be the most perfect three-dimensional shape. So the sun and the moon and uh, the planets were all considered to be, the stars, they were all considered to be um, perfect spherical orbs. Okay. So to them, the entire universe uh, was basically the solar system and uh, and uh, the sun, the earth, the moon and the planets that were known at the time. So that's, that's what they considered the solar system. Um, the stars were considered separate from these and they were imagined to be fixed on the celestial sphere. So I, I told you earlier that they imagined, uh, our ancestors imagined that the earth is at the center and surrounding the earth you have this huge sphere which is called the, the uh, celestial sphere and uh, the constellations and everything are painted on that celestial sphere. So they imagined that the stars were and all were painted on the celestial sphere and the celestial sphere was rotated around the earth and uh, the earth was surrounded by, was orbited by uh, all the other heavenly bodies like the sun, the moon and the planets. So these were orbiting the earth. Okay, so that was the Aristotelian universe, also called the geocentric universe. Remember, geocentric means earth at the center. Okay. Now, what was the compulsion for un trying to understand how the planets and the sun and the moon, uh, how, why was it so important for Aristotle to try to come up with some kind of, kind of a model which explains uh, how the sun and the moon and the planets are orbiting the earth? Why were people interested in, in figuring that out? The reason is, the reason has to do with astrology. So astrology, and, and once again here I'll emphasize that astrology has absolutely no scientific basis, but astrology did play an important role in the development of astronomy as you'll find out. So people believed very strongly in astrology. So they, they saw these spots of light, the, the, the planets and the sun and the moon, uh, in the sky, I mean these objects in the sky, the sun and the moon and the planets, and they believed very strongly that all of these play a very important role in their lives. So they would have a lot of questions such as, uh, when I harvest my plants six months from now, where will the sun be? Which constellation is the sun going to be? Which constellation is the moon going to be? Uh, where is Jupiter, uh, which constellation is Jupiter going to rise in, and so on. So they had a lot of questions like this because they believed that uh, the positions uh, of the planets and the sun and the moon in the skies had uh, definite bearing on their lives, which of course is not true at all, uh, which we know now, but they didn't know that at that time. So they just imagined that um, it's very, very important to know these things and be able to predict these things. And that was the reason for coming up with a model uh, of the solar system, of how uh, things were orbiting, uh, what things, what was actually going on in the skies. Because people wanted to be able to predict things like where is Jupiter going to be six months from now, where is the sun, which constellation is the sun going to rise and so on. So the geocentric model was not very accurate in making these predictions. So for example, if you, if you, uh, so they would build, they, they would create these almanacs which would predict that on so and so date, um, the sun will rise in the constellation Pisces, or on so and so date, the moon uh, uh, or, or Jupiter uh, will be seen in the constellation Aquarius and so on. So they would make these almanacs, uh, but these almanacs were not very accurate. So, uh, so, and, and as time went on after Aristotle, uh, after Aristotle, uh, as the centuries, years and centuries went on, people realized that these 
uh, predictions based on the geocentric model are just completely off. They're not, they're not uh, useful at all. And so five centuries after uh, Aristotle, Ptolemy uh, introduced, made, decided to make a few changes to uh, the geocentric model. Uh, in fact, he ended up making it more complicated. So Ptolemy said, uh, and, and also another problem with the geocentric model was that it did not really explain retrograde motion. So geocentric, the geocentric model had, had two problems. One, it was not very accurate, very accurate. And two, it was not, uh, it, it, it did not explain the retrograde motion of the planets. So that was, that was a problem with the geocentric model. It, it was not very accurate and it also did not explain the retrograde motion of the planets. So Ptolemy, five centuries after Aristotle, Ptolemy decided to make a few changes to the geocentric model. So he said that, okay, here is the Earth. He still assumed that the Earth is at the center of everything. That was the, the most important feature of this model. But he said that instead of orbiting the Earth in perfect circles, what the planets were actually doing so instead of orbiting the Earth like this, what the planets were actually doing was that they were orbiting the Earth in, in circles like this, smaller circles which make up the bigger circle like this. And so these smaller circles were called epicycles. So Ptolemy's idea was that the planets are actually not following one simple circle like this, but they're following many small circles within uh, the large circle. And the advantage of doing this is that now you can explain why there is retrograde motion of the planets. Because if the planets are, dis uh, are, are going on these circular paths, you can see that sometimes they're going backwards. Most of the time they're going forward, but sometimes they're going backwards. For example, when a planet is going through this loop, this little loop here, it's going backwards. Then after it finishes this loop, it's going forward again. But again, it does this loop and it's going backwards. So they assumed, uh, I mean, Ptolemy assumed that the planets actually form, uh, do follow circles. They didn't want to give up the idea of the circles, but uh, they planets are following circles within circles. So these smaller circles were called epicycles. And so Ptolemy introduced the concept of epicycles. And as it turns out, if you assume that the planets are following epicycles, then the model becomes very complicated, but it does become more accurate. So the predictions that you make based on the Ptolemic model, so this model is called the Ptolemic model, So the predictions that you make based on the Ptolemic model are more accurate than the ones that you make with the geocentric model of the, the original geocentric model uh, invented by Aristotle. So Ptolemic model solves the two problems that the geocentric model had. Number one is that it's, uh, the, the first problem was that the geocentric model was not very accurate. The Ptolemic model was, seemed to be more accurate than the geocentric model. And the Ptolemic model also explains, does give an explanation for retrograde motion, though it's a, it's a very, very complicated explanation. Okay, so, oops. so that was the uh, Ptolemic model, which came five centuries after Aristotle. Uh, okay, so as you can see, this was a very, very complicated model. And uh, it, at first, it was more accurate than, the, than, than Aristotle's geocentric model. But people found out that after a few centuries, um, it started getting 
inaccurate again. So in the beginning it was accurate, but after a few centuries it started losing its accuracy and then it became completely inaccurate again. It got more and more inaccurate. Okay. Now one thing you might um, ask uh, is uh, why did people believe in the geocentric model? So you have to remember that the geocentric model was around for almost 14 centuries. So almost 1500 years people believed that the earth was at the center of the entire cosmos and everything, the sun and the moon and the planets was orbiting the earth. But it's the, the whole idea seems a bit silly now. Everybody knows that the sun is at the center and all the planets are orbiting the sun. But why did people believe in the geocentric model for 1500 years? Well, it seemed quite plausible. Like if you put yourself in the shoes of a person who lived at the time of Aristotle, um, the geocentric model is actually quite plausible. Why? Because first of all, um, in the we know now that the Earth is actually revolving around the Sun, right? But if you told that to somebody who lived at the time of Aristotle, they would immediately challenge you. They would say that if the Earth is fl uh, flying through space, as you're saying, then why don't we feel a strong wind in the opposite direction? Because in those days, moving fast meant uh, riding very fast on a horse on horseback. And so if you ride very fast on horseback, you see a wind going in the opposite direction. So people would tell you, uh, why is there not a wind in the opposite direction if the earth is hurtling through space so fast? And then uh, if you say that the sun is the center of the solar system and everything is orbiting the sun, they would they would counter, uh, count, counter that by saying that that doesn't seem to be the case because if you drop something, it falls towards the earth and not towards the sun. So the earth seems to be the center of everything. And so it only makes sense that the Earth is the center of the entire cosmos and everything is orbiting the Sun. So in, in fact, even the Sun seems to be moving around the Earth rather than the uh, other way around. Now, that is what most people would tell you. And that's, that's um, what most people believed. But the smart people knew that the geocentric model must be true for this reason. The stars don't seem to show any parallax at all. So remember what parallax is. We discussed parallax in the last class. I told you that parallax means that uh, if you are standing over here, and this is just a review of what we discussed in the last class, and your friend is standing very, very far away, and you're both looking at this particular object. It could be th the moon or a nearby star. Um, and here are some very distant stars. Here are some other very distant stars. So this person, if they take a picture of the sky or look at the sky, they're going to see this star, the close by star, let's call it S. They're going to see the star S in the background of these stars. Whereas this person will see the star S in the background of these stars. And so if the person on the right takes a picture of the sky with the star S in it, that's going to look a little bit different than the uh, picture of the sky taken by the person on the left the position of star S will look a little bit different in the two pictures. And that, from that distance, from that difference, you can tell the parallax angle of the star S. And just to review, uh, if you draw this line and if you draw this line, this angle up here is called the parallax angle. So this distance, just for review, this distance is called the baseline. So this is all stuff we've discussed in the previous lecture. So what the ancient astronomers uh, n had realized is that none of the stars seem to show any parallax. Uh, at so, so their, their idea was that if the star S is over here, so this is their reasoning, if the star S is over here, and indeed if the Earth is going around the Sun in an orbit like this with the Sun at the center, then there should be if you look at the star S in January versus if you look at the star S in June, there should be a change in the position of star S in the sky. Um, because, you know, like in January, you're going to see it against the background of these stars. And in June, you're going to see it in the background of these stars. So st the position of star S should appear to change slightly 
uh, over six months if the earth indeed was moving around the sun. But this was not seen for any star at all. None of the stars appeared to change their positions at all. So there was no stellar parallax was ever seen by the ancient astronomers. And so they concluded that uh, the only explanation for that is that the earth is not moving. Because if the earth was moving, some of the stars should so show some stellar parallax, but they were not able to measure stellar parallax for any of the stars. Uh, and so they concluded that the Earth must not be moving, the Earth must be at the center of the universe. Okay, now, what is the explanation for this? We know that the Earth is moving, we know that the Earth is actually orbiting the Sun. Why did the ancient astronomers not see any stellar parallax? The reason is, stellar parallax is extremely difficult to measure simply because the stars are insanely, insanely far away from us. The closest star, uh, Alpha Centauri, is four and a half light years away from us or 30 trillion miles away from us. So uh, you can see stellar parallax. And in fact, that is how stellar parallax is measured. You take a picture of the sky in June and then you take another picture of the same sky in in January, six months later, and you compare these two pictures and you'll find that some of the stars have changed position, but that is because we have the ability to take very accurate pictures of the sky right now, and so we are able to measure very, very, very tiny parallaxes. Uh, but our, the ancient astronomers uh, at the time of Aristotle, and also much later, uh, were did not have the ability to um, measure parallax the the very minute stellar parallax that that you that 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 is actually seen they did not have the ability to measure it so they concluded that there is no parallax and so the sun uh, the earth must be stationary so these are some reasons why uh, people at the time of aristotle and much later also believed that the um, geocentric model must be true geocentric model meaning the earth is at the center and everything orbits the earth. Uh, these are some of the reasons why people believed it. And the most important reason was this last one. So if you asked some very smart person at the time why they believed the geocentric model is true, they would tell you because there is no stellar parallax has ever been observed. Um, that's, that's the reason why the smart people believed that the Earth must be the center of the universe. So on an exam, if I asked you what was the most important reason why people believe that the geocentric model is true, uh, the correct answer is the, the stars did not show any st stellar parallax. Okay. All right, so another interesting historical fact is that Aristotle's geocentric theories had become linked to the t teachings of the Catholic Church uh, over the centuries. So the teachings of the Catholic Church and Aristotle's beliefs had gotten to get linked over the years, uh, over the centuries. Um, and you can see that Aristotle's geocentric universe is actually quite compatible with, the, excuse me, with the with the Christian uh, beliefs of heaven and hell. So. In the geocentric universe, you have the Earth, which is where we live, and then you have the the heavens. The heavens were believed to be uh, the most perfect realm, and that is where God lives. So, in in the heavens, so that's the that's that's where uh, God lives. So the heavens were believed to be the realm of absolute perfection because God lives in the heavens. And uh, in fact, um, the stars were also thought to be holes uh, in, the, in, 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 in the celestial sphere uh, and through which the glory of God shines through. So, uh, so that's, that's how they thought about the stars, like they're these little holes through which the glory of God is shining through. And uh, so the heavens are, are the realm of perfection. Uh, we live on the earth. The earth is imperfect because we are not yet completely perfect. What is below us? So underneath lies hell. So 
hell was believed to exist underneath, inside the earth. So above us is heaven, underneath is hell, right? And then and we live in this region, uh, which is not as bad as hell, but nowhere near as great as heaven. Okay. So, and that is also another reason why I told you earlier that um, the heavenly objects like the, the sun and the moon were imagined to be these perfect orbs, perfect spherical orbs, because the closer you are to heaven, um, the more perfect things get. So uh, the sun and the moon, the, these things are, are and, and the planets are, are much higher above the earth, so they're much closer to heaven. So they were expected to be these perfect orbs of uh, spherical orbs of light. So the geocentric model seemed to fit with the beliefs of the Catholic Church. Um, so the most perfect region was the starry sphere, and the celestial sphere with the stars, and the most imperfect region was believed to be the center of the earth. And so this matched the commonly held uh, Christian beliefs of heaven and hell at the time. So the problem was that anybody who was challenging Aristotle's geocentric model was not only ch challenging Aristotle, but also belief in heaven and hell. And so challenging, therefore, the beliefs of the Catholic Church. Okay. Now, so this is how things were almost 1500 years, right? So that's what people believe for 1500 years. Nicholas Copernicus is the one person who started a revolution in our understanding of astronomy. So that is what we're going to talk about now, the Copernican revolution. So Nicholas Copernicus was born in 1473 to a merchant family in Poland. He was orphaned at, at, at 10, and then he was raised by his uncle, who sent him to study law and medicine. In those days, you could study multiple things like this. You could be an expert in law and also an expert in medicine. So after studying law and medicine, Copernicus was a, a, actually a very devout Christian. Um, and so he took a job in the Catholic Church as a canon. A canon is the equivalent of a administrative assistant and that is what that is the only job he did for most that's the job that he did for most of his life uh, he was also tremendously interested in in astronomy so copernicus knew about the ptolemic model uh, which says that all these planets uh, are going around everything is going around the earth uh, not just in circles but in circles within circles and so he realized that this is a very, very ugly model. Like this can explain, uh, this is able to ex successfully explain um, where Jupiter is going to rise, which in which constellation, which constellations the sun is going to rise and sun is going to set in so and so date and, and all that stuff. But it's a very, very complicated model. And it, it can also explain the retrograde motion of the planets too, but it's just so horrendous, uh, such an ugly model. So Copernicus realized that you can explain the motion of the planets uh, much more simply if you completely throw away this geocentric model. And instead, if you come up with a heliocentric model, if you assume a heliocentric model with the sun at the center of the solar system and everything orbiting the sun. So if you assume that the sun is at the center, and all the planets are orbiting the sun, and the Earth too is a planet that's orbiting the sun. And in fact, the only thing that's orbiting the Earth is the moon, that's all. The moon is the only thing orbiting the Earth, but the Earth itself, like the other planets, are orbiting the sun. Then you can, you A, have a very simple model, um, and B, the model can easily explain retrograde motion of the planets, and C, it can also make predictions uh, which are as accurate as the ones made by uh, the Ptolemic model. So you get everything that you could get from the Ptolemic model, but with a much, much simpler and easy to understand model, uh, with the sun at the center and all the planets orbiting the sun in circles. So this was Copernicus's idea. It's called the heliocentric model. Helio means sun, centric means the sun is at the center. 
So in this model, every the sun is at the center and everything is orbiting the sun. So he wrote, put all his ideas in a book called The Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres, but he was very scared of publishing the book uh, or making it public because in those days, if you contradicted the church, uh, the consequences could be very, very, very scary. Uh, with the, with the, uh, you could be um, tried by the Inquisition, and uh, and if you were found guilty of heresy, um, which which basically means you don't believe uh, in the uh, beliefs of the church, you don't subscribe to the beliefs of the church, then you could be subjected to all sorts of uh, horrendous punishments including torture and uh, and also uh, really brutal deaths um, so so he was naturally very scared of publishing his his ideas he discussed these ideas with some of his friends uh, but he it was only when he was on his deathbed in uh, so he finished this book in 1529 but he did not send it for publication until 1542 when he was on his deathbed uh, because he knew that he's going to die very soon so he wouldn't live to see the consequences of uh, of spreading these ideas so in 1542 the book was sent for publication and copernicus in fact died before the book was in print Okay, so here is the heliocentric model. The most important idea was that the sun is the center of the universe. The earth spins on its own and is only orbited by the moon and other planets like uh, the earth. Uh, and, and, and like other planets, the earth orbits the sun. So basically all the planets orbit the sun, as I just said, and the moon is the only thing that orbits um, the earth. Now, one really astonishing consequence of that, of, of this heliocentric model, is that you have a very simple and uh, logical and, and natural explanation of retrograde motion. So let me explain how retrograde motion is, uh, can be, uh, let, me, let me show you how retrograde motion can be explained in Copernicus's heliocentric model. So here is the sun. The sun is at the center, right? Let's take, you can take any any planet you want, but let's just take um, the Earth. The Earth is orbiting the Sun like this. And let's take Mars. So this is Earth, this is Mars. Mars is orbiting the Sun in a larger orbit like that. Now, sometimes it happens that the Earth might be lapping Mars. The Earth actually travels faster in its orbit than Mars does. So when the Earth is over here, in the position shown over here, it will actually be passing Mars, overtaking Mars. So it will get here. By the time the Earth moves over here, Mars will have only moved a short distance because the Earth moves faster in its orbit. So what would Mars look like to us if we are on the Earth watching Mars? we would actually find that to us it would look like Mars is moving backwards, right? Uh, because we are moving faster ahead and so we would be lapping Mars and so to us at that time it would look like Mars is moving backwards. We can't tell that we ourselves are moving so to us it would seem like Mars is moving backwards for a little bit. So, so that is why sometimes when we look at the planets in the sky it appears that the planets are moving backwards. And what's really happening is that we are lapping the planets or we are passing by the planets at that time and that's why they appear to be moving backwards. You can think back, think to the time when you're driving by the highway pretty fast. Uh, let's say you're going in the fast lane at 75 miles per hour. And then if you look at the car, slower cars in the other lanes, they will, be appear, they will appear to be moving backwards relative to you. Um, and that's because you're moving at a faster pace than them. So it's exactly the same thing. So as the Earth goes from here to here, Mars only goes from here to here. So from, from the Earth to us, it, it seems like Mars is going backwards. And so that is the reason why we sometimes have C retrograde motion uh, of the planets. It's simply that we are lapping the planet at that time. Uh, and that's why it appears to be moving backwards. So that actually happens to be the true explanation to why we have retrograde motion. So you can see that the heliocentric model uh, that Copernicus invented can very simply explain retrograde motion. You don't need to make all these crazy assumptions about the planets going around in circles uh, 
and 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 circles within circles uh you don't need, you don't need to make all these crazy assumptions in order to explain retrograde motion now so the heliocentric model is much more elegant and did not have any of the complications of the ptolemic system and it was also able to explain most observations but it was mostly ignored uh in the time of uh, copernicus so most of the people so not a lot of people knew about copernicus's model because he didn't really try to publicize it publicize it very much but the people who learned about his model uh realized that it's a it's a very nice model it's very simple and it can explain retrograde motion it can also explain uh, it it can also it's as accurate as the ptolemic model but um they did not really think that uh it's something that they needed to adopt they they didn't think that they need to drop their own understanding of astronomy and adopt this new new understanding so it was mostly ignored in the time of uh copernicus uh it was popularized a lot later by galileo um and uh, and after after that we'll see later on that there was a tremendous backlash from the roman catholic church when this model became popular and it was uh, put in the index of prohibited bo books by the catholic church uh, in 1616 uh, but that's getting a little ahead of ourselves in the story uh, but the point is that it was not uh, adopted at all uh, it was not really given a lot of importance in the time of copernicus okay now there was there, there was a reason why copernicus's model was not um was not universally accepted by the people who knew about it the the reason is that uh copernicus's model was not in not that much more accurate than ptolemy's model so i told you that aristotle's original geocentric model was accurate at the time of aristotle but as time went on as the centuries went on the model started making incorrect predictions it might say that the sun is going to rise in the constellation uh, taurus but you find it rising in a different constellation and so on so it would not really give you accurate predictions but so in order to fix that ptolemy in, uh included the 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 idea of epicycles uh the planets going around in circles within circles and that was uh that helped with the accuracy of the model it helped make more more accurate predictions but it was still people found that after ptolemy the accuracy seems to go down lower and lower and several centuries after ptolemy the accuracy was pretty bad so uh i mean it 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 wasn't good at all it was somewhat accurate but not not very accurate at all in making predictions so copernicus's model seemed to work about the same level of accuracy as ptolemy's model right and so that was one of the flaws in copernicus's model so it was not more accurate than ptolemy's model uh it did not seem to predict planetary motion with greater accuracy than ptolemy's model why is that now you might think that copernicus's model was right so he uh, the, we know the reality now we know that the sun is at the center of the solar system and everything is orbiting the sun so Cop copernicus figured that out so why wasn't his model uh, more accurate the answer is because there was one crucial flaw in copernicus's model copernicus also made the assumption that the planets follow perfectly circular orbits i told you that uh the reason that people believe that anything that's orbiting must be orbiting in a circle because the circle was believed to be the most perfect shape and people couldn't imagine god uh, adopting any other shape for an orbit than a circle because the circle is the most perfect shape so um copernicus being uh, a a devout person uh, also uh held on to the assumption that the orbits of the planets are perfect circles and that was the main reason why his model was not as, uh, not more accurate than ptolemy's model because as we'll see later on the orbits of the planets are not perfect circles um they are ellipses we'll see that later on so because of this incorrect assumption in the in in uh, copernicus's heliocentric model uh it was not able to predict 
make predictions uh, as more accurately than the existing model. So as I said earlier, Copern the hypothesis of Copernicus was uh, was admired but not not accepted, and the slow process by which the Copernican hypothesis was gradually accepted is called the Copernican Revolution, and that's what we are discussing now. So let's try a couple of uh, questions. So the main flaw in the uh, in Ptolemy's model was that it failed to explain retrograde motion of planets. So see if you can answer this question on your own. Pause the video if necessary. So do you agree with the statement that the main flaw in Ptolemy's model was that it failed to explain the retrograde motion of the planets? The answer is no. That, that is false. Can you, can you see why? It's because Ptolemy's model was actually able to explain the retrograde motion of the planets. It it offered a really horrendously complicated explanation with the planets, with this, uh, you know, with the Earth uh, at the center over here, and the Sun and the planets following these really really complicated circles within circles path. But it was able to explain the retrograde motion of the planets. So that was not the problem. Um, the main flaw in Ptolemy's model. Uh, I mean, if you if you want to talk about the flaws of the model, is that it's just horrendously complicated, and then it uh, it was not very accurate, right? But it was able to explain the retrograde motion of the planets. Okay. The heliocentric model assumes. Uh, so, which which of these do you think is true? So, feel free to pause the video and see if you can figure out which one is the correct answer here. The heliocentric model. Heliocentric, you should be able to tell that from the name. The heliocentric model, model assumes that the Sun is the center of the solar system. So this is the correct answer. All right, let's try this one. Copernicus's heliocentric model was significantly more accurate than the existing model. Do you think that this is true? We just talked about that a little while ago. See if you can figure it out yourself. The correct answer is false. So Copernicus's heliocentric model was actually not more accurate than the existing model. And that is because, what was the reason for that? Uh, a follow-up question to this would be, what was the reason? Why was Copernicus's heliocentric model not more accurate than the existing model? The answer is because Copernicus assumed that the planets orbit the sun in perfect circles. So he still held on to the belief that or all orbits are perfect circles. And that is why his um, model, that was, th that was a flaw in his model. And that's why it gave the wrong answers. All right, so that is Copernicus. In the next lecture, we are going to learn about two other towering personalities in, in astronomy, uh, Galileo and, and Kepler.